Welcome back to another edition of STAT 568 Design and Analysis of Experiments. Today what we'll be doing is going a little bit further into multi-factor designs. Last time we just looked at the complete randomized block design, and it was great. But now we're going to go a little bit further, looking at not one-way, but two-way ANOVA. And we'll be looking at the Latin square, which will be a really interesting way to efficiently test a, a treatment with multiple blocking factors. So let's go take a look at that. And we're back with another lecture of STAT 568 Design and Analysis of Experiments. Today what we'll be talking about are more multi-factor experimental designs. So last time we did the complete randomized block design. We showed how that's related to a paired two sample test. Um, and we also looked at the uh, Tukey one degree of freedom test for testing for specific interactions between a block factor and a um, treatment factor. Well, today what we'll be doing is looking at two-way um, ANOVA, which is going to allow us to have more than one treatment in our design uh, and then we'll go into other special ways of doing blocking, specifically the Latin and the uh, Greco-Latin square designs, which give us very specific ways to arrange factors, both treatment and block factors, in a design uh, very carefully with, again, the main goal of minimizing the amount of the, the sample size, right, and the amount of uh, energy and cost and everything that it requires to run such a design. So. Let's get into that. All right, so today, the first thing we're gonna talk about is the, uh, I have two-way layout or the two-way ANOVA in con as in contrast to what we discussed in the first chapter, which was one-way ANOVA. So this is really not gonna look that much different than what we did with the um, block, um, the complete randomized block design last time, except that now, we're going to include an interaction term because we might have two treatments. Say we have um, two different medications for blood pressure and we want to know one, how they each independently affect the subjects, but also do they in have an interaction? Um, and in this case, unlike the blocking case, we're assuming or we're considering that there may be a uh, non-trivial interaction between our treatments. And it makes sense whether it's um, taking two different medications at once, um, applying two different additives to soil to help um, plants grow. Um, oftentimes when you apply two things together, there's a chance they're going to interact. So let's talk about that. Um, well, first, just to recall, we'll say recall that, um, well, we recall one way ANOVA, which in my notes, I wrote in the form um, y i j is going to be mu, the global mean, plus tau i, the um, ith treatment effect, plus epsilon i j. So here we would have our global mean. We would have our ith treatment effect and our um, i j random noise, which as always in this course, we'll assume is going to be normal um, with some unknown variance. Again, not always the case in practice, but typically the way we will proceed in this course. Okay, so we have um, that. Well, when we move into the idea of a uh, of two-way ANOVA, now I'm gonna change the notation slightly. And in this case, we're going to just throw a whole bunch more Greek letters in there because you got to love the uh, the Greek letters in uh, in experimental design. So we're going to use I J L. So now we have a triple index um, for basically it's going to be treatment. Um, let's say uh, factor A at level I, factor B at level J. And the replication, because we have to replicate now to be able to test for an interaction, replicate L. So 
I'll write that all out and then it'll maybe make a little bit, maybe a little bit clearer. So we're going to have an alpha I, we're going to have a beta J, we're going to have a gamma I J, that's the interaction bit. And then we're going to have an epsilon I J L. So again, we have here going through all the terms, we have our global mean, we have our ith um, effect for, we'll say, factor A. Uh, for beta, it's going to be the jth effect for factor B. So again, you can think of factors A and B as, say, maybe the dosages of a certain medicine or the amount of additives put into the soil if you're studying agriculture. Um, and in this case, I is just going to tell us what level that factor is at. Is it, say, low dosage or zero, low, medium, high, for example? Um, uh, we're also going to have our gamma in here, which is going to be the IJ. Um, I'm going to say A cross B interaction. In the other notes, sometimes I should say, uh, maybe in blue, just to keep with the uh, multicolor scheme here, I'll say sometimes uh, gamma IJ, we might write that as I did um, in a previous lecture as um, alpha beta i j and that's just to emphasize that it's the interaction between alpha and beta but it's not strictly that i'm multiplying those two things together it's actually a separate term that has i guess i cross j or i guess if they're k levels then it's some number of different levels that it can achieve as a factor it's not strictly multiplication um i'll say sometimes right it has that. And then, of course, we have, once again, I'll just write the arrow in from up here, our random noise. Um, this is for replicate L. All right, so to keep things, um, to keep things a little bit uh, simpler, what we can do is we can assume that we replicate every treatment the same number of times. What that means is for a specific level of factor A and a specific level for factor B, we're going to replicate it the same number of times. I think in my notes I was using probably little n, yeah, little n as the number of replicates. So here we have, I'll say, um, with i going from 1 to ka, which is the number of levels in factor A, with j going from 1 to KB, the number of levels in factor B, and L going from 1 to N, where this is the number of replicates per um, treatment. And remember, the treatment in this case is the combination of the experimental factors. So a specific value for I and a specific value for J is kind of the the treatment. So for every combination, every val every combination of I and J, we're going to have n replicates. I always have to make sure I say replicate and not replicant because that's a slightly different thing. If you're a Blade Runner fan, not the same as experimental design, but still kind of a neat idea, I guess, uh, science fiction wise. Anyway, um, yeah, so. We have all of this. Again, um, one thing just to note, note this is mathematically the same as replicating a, C, R, B, D, the complete randomized block design from the previous lecture. Um, but typically, a block is something like, let's say, age range um, or 
other things like that or um i don't know i'm trying to think what else could be a good blocking factor i guess age range let's say sex let's say a person's weight it would have to be a weight category um because you could use okay you could use a person's actual weight as a covariate and we'll talk about that when we do ancova a slide which is analysis of variance with covariates um but any sort of categorical or ordinal categorical um variable um that typically is not something that we're testing or we're applying to the subject but something that's kind of just already there uh, would be our blocks um meanwhile right um uh and again we i should say where we typically assume no block treatment interaction um and okay that could not necessarily be true right you could have say your blood pressure medication which may affect the elderly more than young people um or vice versa um but really what the block is doing is saying that let's say on average i'm just going to make this up because i don't really know the biology but we'll say as people get older maybe their blood pressure gets higher um on average so or maybe there's a higher variance in their blood pressure and we have to account for that so by blocking um, based on age category you control for that um, and as i mentioned in the last class we typically would just make the assumption that there isn't going to be an interaction there um, between the block and the treatment of course oftentimes there actually may be and in that case we could replicate it and if we were to replicate such an experiment a complete randomized block design we'd really have mathematically the same thing as a two-way layout where we'd be able to um, uh, have an interaction term in our model And yeah, when we, um, so that's this little side note, we'll block that off. Um, now, when we consider this, uh, this was such a model, let me write it again, because it's now fallen off the top of the page. We have something, my one note will stop jumping around. Um, just to write it out again, we have something that looks like mu alpha i, beta j, the interaction term gamma i j, and epsilon i j l for the noise now once again what we do is we do a sum of squares decomposition and the sum of squares decomposition uh, is going to allow us to do our statistical hypothesis testing with the f test so in this case our total sum of squares we'll say ss tot is going to just be a well just <laughs> it's going to be a triple sum so we're going to need three sigmas here. Yeah, these things get kind of nasty looking after a while. Um, we have I from one to KA. We have J from one to KB. And we have L from one to uh, N, the number of replicates. And what we'd be doing is we'd be taking our IJ elf observation, subtracting the global mean, which is going to have three dots now, saying that we're averaging over all three indices uh, squared. And again, skipping the, the tedious arithmetic, uh, what we're going to end up with is an A sum of squares for factor A, a B sum of squares for factor B, an interaction sum of squares, which I'll write as A cross B, uh, and then finally an error sum of squares or a residual sum of squares for whatever is left over. So, um, right, we have the actual equations for all of these. I will write them down just to make it, they're in my uh, typed up notes, but um, it's kind of nice just to look at just so we have them written down. Remember, when we do the A sum of squares, we're actually summing over all the J index in, well, we're summing over J and we're summing over L. Um, and since uh, factor A doesn't depend on J or L, it only depends on I, what we get is we get an N and a KB out front. And then we're summing over all I from one to KA. And what we're summing is just going to be YI 
dot dot or bar dot dot minus y bar dot 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 and similarly for the other um similarly for the other term um that is for the b sum of squares it's going to look exactly the same except i'm replacing um, a and b inside the equation and i'm replacing not an equal sign i'm replacing um the uh, j or i index with a j index and otherwise nothing really has changed here except the dot positions and whatnot that's too many dots we need three dots all right um the interaction term now is going to be a little bit different because we didn't have this in the last design so it's worth writing down in this case, we're still summing over all of the replicates, so we still have an n out front. We're not the the summing over l doesn't change um, doesn't have any effect, but to just replicate or add this thing to itself n times. Uh, so now we're going to sum j from one to k a, and we're going to sum i from one to k b. Um, and in this case, what we have is we have the the ij ij dot so we have the average of all the observations such that with um a specific i level for factor a a b a, a j level for factor b and we're averaging over all of the replicates so this is why we need to replicate because we need to be able to in some sense have a third index in our y i j l in this case so that we can average over l and keep ij fixed um, and then we get this kind of peculiar thing here where what we do is we subtract um, the mean from i we subtract the mean over um, with a fixed j and then we actually end up adding back the global mean again i'm not going to go through the actual derivation of this but if you do it like we did in the previous lectures you can kind of see where this comes from basically throw away the squares and note that you have to add and basically add up all the terms to make sure you get the the thing for the total sum of squares on the left hand side of this equation i'll put star up here right so we have that and then we just have the air sum of squares which is um not too exciting the the air sum of squares in this case is just we're summing over all i j and l and we're summing the the usual thing which ah there's a bar in there that i need to remove a typo in my notes we're summing the i j l observation and we're subtracting the category the i j interaction category uh mean and yeah that's what we get for our sum of squares decomposition and I think if we were to put all of these back together, just doing it by eyesight really fast, yeah, it looks like everything should cancel out because you have you have two y i bars, and you have you have a y i bar and a minus y bar i, and you have a y bar j and a minus y bar j, and so on. So um, anyway, the the more interesting bit than actually writing this down is going to be um their distribution under the null hypothesis right which is going to be chi squared so what i'll do over here is say that these well i'll say under h naught remember the I, I say under h naught or under the null hypothesis just as like a blanket statement but what i mean by that is that each of these terms has their own null hypothesis for factor a it's that there, none of the levels of factor A have any different effect than any others. For factor B, it's none of the levels of factor B have any effect different than the others. And for the interaction, it would be that um, none of the interaction terms are different from any others, which if we assume the sum to zero constraint, then we're just saying that none of the, um, none of the factor levels are different than zero if we assume again sum to zero as our constraint to make this uh, mathematically make sense right anyway um, under the null hypothesis for each of these terms respectively we get chi-squared distributions 
and the degrees of freedom are going to be important. Um, again, the way to think about it is often how many things am I do I have in each term and how many things am I estimating? For the first one, I have i, and i runs from 1 to ka, so I get a ka here, um, but I have to subtract 1 for the global mean. And similarly, for this um, term, we have j from 1 to kb, so I have a kb here, but I have to subtract 1 for the global mean. Um, for the interaction term now, things are, well, you kind of saw what it was in the um, complete randomized uh, block design. It's actually going to be, I'll just write down the answer and then we'll talk about it in a second. It's going to be Ka minus 1, Kb minus 1, um, which if we kind of write that is going to equal Ka, Kb minus Ka minus Kb plus one. So if we go back to the sum of squares equation um, on the, well, the left and the center here, what we have is we have Ka times Kb uh, y bar i j's, which is a weird sentence to say out loud, but it's basically I have Ka times Kb of those terms. Then I have to subtract Ka of these subtract kb of those but i get one back from the uh from the uh global mean again it's not the it's, it's not always the most satisfying thing to do to go about it in this way but it allows us to kind of um intuitively understand what's going on and not actually have to go through all of the linear algebra headache that would be to actually properly use cochrane's theorem to determine the degrees of freedom um so uh, that's those terms. And then the last one, which I'm going to write on the next line here, is our error sum of squares. This is the only one that doesn't require a null hypothesis. We always assume that the error sum of squares follows a chi-square distribution um, with a certain degrees of freedom. In this case, we have the total sample size, which is going to be n, k, a, k, b. And we're going to subtract um, the k, a times k, b group or category means um, that come into play here. So yeah, there's a lot of, again, the, the degrees of freedom are a very critical part of the course. Um, and they're also can be quite confusing. So please talk to me um, in discussion times and office hours if you have questions about where some of these numbers are coming from. Uh, the one thing that's always good to check to make sure I didn't make a mistake is that if I were to say take all of these degrees of freedom and add them together, I should get the total sample size minus one, which is the degrees of freedom for the total sum of squares. So let's just make sure that that actually works. If I take all of these terms, we'll write this as Ka, Kb minus Ka minus Kb plus one, it's arithmetic, but it's uh, annoying arithmetic, isn't it? N, K, A, K, B, minus K, A, K, B. And then if we kind of work our way through this with my red, um, what we should get is, well, K, A here cancels out with this K, A, and this K, B cancels out with that K, B, and this minus one cancels out with that plus one, this interaction term cancels out with this. And the only thing we have left is the total sample size and a minus one. So that's basically the ranks of these respective matrices if we go back to what we learned about Cochrane's theorem um, and how they all kind of add up nicely together. So, okay, we got what we wanted. That's good. Um, and then from here, uh, well, we basically just go forward and we say, ah, now we can do F tests. So what I'll say is from here, we can do, I'll say global, ah, global F tests for A, B, and A cross B. Um, 
it is always good to remember that we are doing three hypothesis tests here. So we may need to consider multiple testing correction. This is only three. Uh, it's not terribly large number, but it's still good to always be in that mindset because as we go further in the course and we get to factorial designs, we could be doing eight or 16 different um, hypothesis tests and then we really need to account for multiple testing. So we'll put a side note. Consider multiple testing corrections, which we will do in a future lecture when we look at this more properly. Um, but for now, I'll just say, for example, replace the test size alpha, which is kind of abusing or over overloading the notation um, with, let's say, alpha divided by three, which is Bonferroni's method. If I can spell that correctly, well, that's close enough. I always forget how many R's and F's and whatnot and N's are in Bonferroni. That doesn't quite look right. I think it's only one R. Doesn't really matter. Uh, we'll just end. We'll just end that parenthesis. So yeah, the point is is that uh, we are going to end up doing three different hypothesis tests. So it is worth considering that you are in a multiple testing scenario. The nice thing is is that because um, I should say. Um, given this setup, all hypothesis tests are independent, which is nice. Um, because it's not always the case. If you're just doing, say, linear regression and you have, say, um, two different um, independent variables and you want to consider the interaction of those independent variables, um, typically you're not going to have independent hypothesis tests because the points, the data that you collected is just kind of whatever you get. But in an experimental design setting, we carefully um, consider all of the data points we have. We make sure that for every level of A, we test B, and for every level of B, we test A, and we test it the same number of times, in this case, N replicates. If we don't have the same number of replicates in each of the treatment categories, we're not going to have independent tests. Things will be a little bit, um, well, messier. So if possible, it's always good to have the same number of uh, observations in each treatment category like we set up in this setting or like we designed this to be. Um, oh yes, and one more thing. You can then do a post hoc dookie test if um, the F test rejects H naught. The last thing to point out is that you can do a post hoc Tukey test in this case if you reject the respective F test. So if you, for example, rejected the uh, null hypothesis for factor A or B or the interaction term, you can then do a post hoc Tukey test to compare the different categories. Now, it's important that I emphasize that you have to reject the F test first. Um, last year, which would have been, I guess, 2020, um, I put a question like that on the, uh, the midterm and said, you know, what can we, what do we see from this, the, what can we learn from this Tukey test? Um, and most people said, oh, well, we see there's a difference in these categories. And I said, no, no, the point is you, you can't learn anything because we didn't reject the initial F test. And if you don't reject the global test, you can't look for pairwise differences. It's like you're saying there are no significant differences here. So now we're going to go look for significant differences. Like, yeah, don't, don't do that. Yeah, don't do that at all. Um, otherwise, yeah, you can just proceed as usual and um, do your uh, post hoc testing. So if you're reading along in my notes, I have a very small like half page on random effects. I don't really like the discussing the random effects in this setting. Um, so I'm going to actually just skip that. In some sense, I should probably just delete it from my course notes because it's better reserved for other um, courses.
But the next thing we need to do is discuss the uh, Latin square design. Oh yeah, we got time to keep working on this. All right, so that's the end of our two-way ANOVA. Now let's consider Latin squares. Latin squares are one of these fun little mathematical objects. And even if you don't know what a Latin square is, I'm sure you actually have seen them before. There are Sudoku puzzles, for example. The Sudoku puzzle um, has an extra restriction, which is that you have to have every sub three by three square has to have all of the symbols appear once. But I'm getting ahead of myself. The idea of a Latin square is basically a k by k square with symbols with I think k different symbols different symbols such that each row and column only uh, basically has one of each symbol. So, for example, I think I have, I mean, the easiest one to do would just be a three by three. And I say symbol because it could be anything. You could put numbers in there like you would in a Sudoku puzzle. It doesn't have to be numbers. It can be letters. It can be smiley face, star, frowny face, if you really want. Um, I'll use letters and it would look, for example, something like this, A, B, C, B, C, A, um, C, A, B for the building that uh, I currently am not allowed to go into because of COVID. And here what we have now is a three by three Latin square. Um, but we could actually extend that. Um, to uh, larger Latin squares, that is four by four, five by five, six by six, even though that's a little bit of a weird one, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, and the Latin square is going to allow us to have a very efficient way to test, um, to test a treatment within two different blocks. Um, sometimes you could try to plug in more treatments, but again, you don't have we're not going to have enough, we're, unless we replicate it, we're not going to be able to test for interaction. So the classic setup for the Latin square, I'll just, why don't I just write this down before, rather than rambling out loud about it. The classic setup is sort of two block factors, one treatment factor or experimental factor, if you want to call it that. Um, and like literally this came from the idea of taking a big plot of land in agricultural research and cutting it up into little square plots. So you actually had the physical square sort of cut up on the ground. Um, a lot of the stuff that we'll be discussing here comes from um, agricultural research and proper statistical designs for agricultural research. I always wonder when I'm driving down the street towards the university, or I should say up the street heading north, um, past the uh, U of uh, U Alberta farm campus, if they ever do anything like this uh, at their uh, setup. I don't actually know anyone in agriculture, so maybe I should go knock on their door, even though I guess nobody's in their office at the moment. Um, anyway, so let's do a four by four example to show you what I mean. And the idea is that we can have block factor one, which is going to be something, this is going to be block one. Ah, but I didn't give myself enough room, so let's just move this down ever so slightly. If my computer is willing, excellent. Um, and then what we'll do is we'll have a one, two, three, four, and this will be block two. So we have two different block factors, and then we're going to have a single treatment factor, which I'm going to denote by A through D. Um, and in this case, we can have, say, we'll change the color. Let's say A, B, C, and D. B, D, or B, A, D, 
and C. Let's see if I can do this right. C, D, A, and B. And lastly, the alphabet backwards, D, C, B, and A. So in this case, we would have sample size of 16 with, again, two block, I guess, three factors. So we have two blocks, one treatment, and a sample size of 16. And this is quite neat because, um, you know, if we did this as a, if doing a complete randomized block design, well, what we would want to do is we would want to see, um, we would want to see every level of the treatment within every block combination. Um, I shouldn't put an error there because that's not a CRB. If doing a complete randomized block design, um, we'd have basically, well, what? We'd have how many different block combinations were there? There's We would have four times four times four, uh, which in this case would be 64, so a much larger sample size. Because in the complete randomized block design, for every combination of block one and block two, we would have to see all four treatments. In this case, not every possible combination of block one, block two, and the treatment occur. Um, for example, you know, if I know um, the level of block one and the level of block two, only a single treatment is tested. But because of this nice setup, we have a lot of, well, elegant properties that we can use. And I actually have a pretty cool example of this that I used um, when collecting my own data, which maybe we'll talk about at the end of this course or this lecture. Um, but for now, what you can imagine is it's a big plot of land and someone just cut it up into a four by four grid of 16 subplots. And then on each of them, they applied some factor level A, B, C, or D, which could be the a different type of fertilizer, say. And we want to know how many plants grew or the size of the, the output of our plants in each of these um, squares would be one example. So the model that we end up with um, is going to look like something like Y, I, J, L again, um, but it's going to be a bit different than that two-way layout that we did last time. We're going to have a mu, we're going to have an alpha I, we're going to have a beta J. I'm going to use those for the block, so I apologize that I'm kind of swapping my notation around, but um, these are going to be for the row and the column. And then we're going to have a tau L for the treatment, and then we're going to have an epsilon I, J, L. For the noise. So once again, I'm you well, know, mu is always the global mean. I'm not going to write that again because I wrote that like 10 times already. Um, this is going to be alpha i is the ith row effect. Um, beta j is going to be the jth column effect. And then tau l is going to be the elf treatment effect. Um, and then of course, noise, epsilon, i, j, l. Um, and just by noting though that not every index combination of i, j, and l exists. Um, so it's a little bit different than the last time and the sum of squares will kind of reflect that. Um, so it's a little, yeah, it's a slightly more confusing, but um, what we end up with is we still get a nice sum of squares decomposition, um, which in this case is going to become um, the row sum of squares, the column sum of squares, and the treatment sum of squares, TRT for treat, and um, the air sum of squares. So in this case, we're going to have, well, a slightly different formulation and slightly different degrees of freedom 
Um, for the row sum of squares, what we do is we sum i from 1 to k of, and remember, in this case, one of the weird little subtleties of the Latin square is that all of the factors, block and treatment, all have to have the same number of levels, which make it a little bit um, cumbersome, I guess, or restrictive, maybe is right the right word, a little bit restrictive in the sense that you actually have to have the same number of levels in each case. Um, so yeah, there's a little bit of issues there um, because oftentimes you may not have the same number of levels for each factor. Anyway, um, yes, so for the row sum of squares, what we end up with is we end up actually with a k times the average over i minus y bar dot 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 squared. Um, for the column sum of squares, we have in some sense the exact same thing, um, just switching i for j and moving my index 1 down. So dot j dot, that's not a double square, that's a 2 and that's a dot dot dot. Um, we'll also have our, um, in this case, treatment sum of squares, which again is going to look exactly the same except that j becomes l and the index moves one more down and dot 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 uh, and the last one which is the error sum of squares and this one becomes a little bit harder to write down explicitly because the summation is a bit weird and in my notes i just sort of said we're summing over i j and l but it's restrictive in the sense that if I have a specific value for i and j, there's only one possible value for l based on that above square that's running off the top of the screen. So in some sense, I'm only summing over, in this case, k squared or in the case where k is equal to 4, 16 different terms in this sum because we only have 16 or k squared observations, not k cubed. Like I said, degrees of freedom and the sum of squares start to get pretty complicated, but the Latin square is actually quite interesting. And I believe there it shows up um, not just in agricultural research, but in things like marketing research and other places. Um, so we'll have to uh, investigate that further because I believe I have some, uh, there's some articles that discuss that um, for your um, review and article project. Okay, so I'm going to write this down again. I really don't want to go through the headache of trying to derive the whole thing because it's, well, it's super annoying. Um, but if you really wanted to, you can take the total sum of squares, you can decompose it into the specific sums of squares, um, and then you can work through it using something like uh, Cochrane's theorem again. Now, in this case, each of these terms under their respective null hypotheses, again, always, always under the null hypothesis because that's what we're doing. We're in frequentist statistics. Um, all of these are going to have degrees of freedom k minus 1, which kind of makes sense um, because what it is is it's saying I have k category means and I have one global mean that I'm subtracting from that. Uh, so I have k minus 1. Now, then the question is, well, what in the world do I do with the degrees of freedom for this guy? Um, well, the easiest way to, uh, well, there's actually, I guess there's two ways to do it. If you want to do the degrees of freedom um, using my little counting, I shouldn't call it mine, just like it is just an easy counting method, then what you can do is look to see how many terms are in each of these or how many yeah, how many unique values are in each of these terms? So the first one we would have is k squared um, for the because uh, we have k squared observations. Then we would have k observations um, at um, k mean yeah k means, which is a whole nother thing. Um, k category means for i, k category means for j, k category means for l.
and then we can actually add a two on there at the end. So this kind of thing is going to be, uh, well, k squared minus 3k plus 2. And if you remember factoring um, polynomials like you would have done in a high school algebra class, presumably, then uh, what you end up with is k minus 1, k minus 2 as our degrees of freedom for the air sum of squares. And once again, we can add these all together to make sure they actually work out. And sure enough, if I add k minus 1 plus k minus 1 plus k minus 1 plus this thing for the air sum of squares, I'll get exactly k squared minus 1, which is the degrees of freedom for the total sum of squares. All right. <laughs> so we have that. Um, and yeah, that means that our, I mean, um, that means that we can do our F test as usual. Um, and the point is, so again, I kind of mentioned this before, but the, the main point is sort of efficiency. It's efficiency in the sense that um, we can test three factors with only k squared observations, not k cubed, which could be quite a big increase, right? like going from 16 to 64 is a pretty big increase and you may not have the budget um, or the ability to collect that much data in your experiment. I mean, if it's 10 by 10, right, you're going from 100 to um, 1,000, which is quite extreme um, and gets worse from there. Um, yeah, so that's really the main thing. And once again, um, we must assume no interaction interactions between any of the factors pairwise or I'll say all three at once. So it's not just we need no pairwise interaction and no triple interaction. Typically, higher order interactions are very rare anyway, after you've considered the lower order interactions in the main terms. But it is something to remember that if there are interactions, they will affect the significance tests that you do. Um, so again, we can use Tukey one degree of freedom if you want to look for an interaction um, or um, replicate to test for interactions. Right, so those are the two different things you can do sort of going forward um, if you have this. I have an example of some um, agricultural data that I will look at. But I'm going to save that for the sort of third part of this lecture, um, because before I jump into that, what I would like to do is look at the, just discuss the Greco-Latin square, and then I think we'll stop here and do a little bit of R code, just as an example. Um, so the next thing to discuss is the Greco-Latin square. So the Greco-Latin square, um, this is extends the Latin square uh, to have two blocks and two treatments. Again, strictly speaking, they don't have to be two blocks and two treatments. You just have four different factors. Um, but 
uh, again, this is coming from the agricultural setting where, again, you're actually blocking by row and column within some uh, actual plot of land that you're chopping up. Um, but uh, yeah, so that's the so the traditional setup would be two blocks and two treatments. It doesn't strictly have to be that way, but we still have to assume no interactions. So if you have four different treatments, you have to have a pretty strong assumption that none of them are interacting with each other, or um, you could run into some trouble. And this will actually come back again when we look at factorial designs and things like that. But OK, so what is a Greco-Latin square? So the rough idea, the idea is to combine two orthogonal, there's a good math word, orthogonal Latin squares. So if you're familiar with linear algebra, you know that um, the idea of orthogonality, right? You have two vectors are orthogonal to each other. It means they're at a right angle. Um, and that notion is extended in various ways mathematically. Now for the Latin square, you can actually have so if you have one Latin square, you can permute the rows and the columns to get a new Latin square, but it would be equivalent to the first one because you're just flipping rows and columns around. If you can write down another Latin square that cannot be translated into the first one by row and column swaps, it's orthogonal. So in this case, that is, we'll say two Latin squares that can not be transformed into one another via row and column swaps. I guess they would say row and column operations, I guess, but effectively you're just swapping them. So that's the way I like to think about it. Um, so the, 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 it's quite interesting because you either have a Latin square that is equivalent and you can't have two equivalent Latin squares to combine because if you combine two equivalent Latin squares, the factors actually overlap each other and you can't test for them independently. They confound or they, um, I guess alias would be another term. They kind of um, overlap each other in that way. Whereas if you have them orthogonal to each other, you're actually testing the two treatment factors independently of each other, which is quite neat that you can cram an entire another factor into your K by K sample. So yeah, let's, uh, let's write that down. If we take the Latin square we had from above, which is going to be A, B, C, D, B, C, D, A, D, C, oops, A, D, C, D, C, A, B, B, and an A. All right, we got that one. So this would be our the same Latin square I had above. Now, it's Latin because it's the Latin alphabet characters. Now, let's say we cross that. I'm not even sure if that's the right mathematical notation, so maybe I shouldn't uh, do a cross because the the time sign with a cross in it is kind of a specific mathematical term. Um, so we'll just put a comma there. And I can write down a, well, a Greco square, which will have the Greek letters alpha, beta, gamma, delta in it. So I can say alpha, beta, gamma, delta. These would be the four levels of a new treatment factor. Um, gamma, delta, oops, that's not a delta, gamma, delta, alpha, beta, delta, gamma, beta, alpha, yeah, swap those, delta, gamma, beta, alpha, and lastly, beta, alpha, delta, gamma. Sounds like I'm sending out some sort of radio signal. <laughs> Okay, so now that we have our two 
orthogonal Latin squares. So the claim is that you can't transform. So you could replace, say, the alpha, beta, gamma, delta with A, B, C, D. And then the claim that I make is that you can't permute the rows and columns of the first one to get the uh, to the first Latin square to get the um, form of the second Latin square. Um, and if we combine them, we combine them by actually just applying, um, say, factor level A alpha to the first one, and then B gamma to B gamma to this one, and C delta to that one, and D, I guess, beta, and then so on. So I'm going to write this out. It's kind of, well, at least this one's not so bad. We'll say C gamma D delta. Um, and then we get what a delta d alpha c beta d oop, jumped on me again d gamma a beta and b alpha and lastly we're going to have c alpha b delta almost there guys and a gamma all right so that looks kind of nasty but the interesting thing about this square is that every combination of letters latin plus Greek occurs exactly one time. So you can check that if you want, that if you pick any combination like C and Delta, then there should be somewhere a single copy of C and Delta in there. And similar to all of them, there should be no repeats. If there's a repeat, we did something wrong and we have to go back. Um, and again, this is um, so this is just one way that you can now cram another factor into your model, assuming that there's no interactions. The um, you're going to end up with, let's say, an SS row, an SS column. We'll say an SS maybe Latin for the Latin character and a sum of squares for the I'll say GRK for the Greek characters. And all of these are going to have um, chi squared with k minus one degrees of freedom still. And now our air sum of squares is going to lose another k minus one degrees of freedom. And it's going to look something like, um, yeah, it's going to be k squared minus 4k plus plus. No, is it minus? No, plus three. Yeah, plus three which if we factor that is going to be k minus three, k minus one. So a couple things to note. Um, well, first of all, you can't have k equal to three because then you're going to have zero degrees of freedom for the air sum of squares. And it turns out that, yeah, there's only one equivalent class or of Latin square when you look at a three by three. Um, Going higher than that, yeah, you can do a 4x4 four four Greco-Latin square or 5x5. Five five. Um, one little fun fact, I'll say fun fact, kind of an annoying fact actually. There are no Greco-Latin squares when K is equal to six. So why? That's uh, you have to ask a combinatorist and complain to them um, because it has to do with factoring in a weird way. If you're if k is a prime number or a power of a prime number, like four is two times two, or five is prime, seven is prime, nine is three by times three. Um, you know, 16 is still good. That's two to the four. So if you're a prime or you're a power of a prime, you're pretty much set because uh, 
math said so. Uh, we we're not going to get into that at the moment, but if you happen to know much about um, number theory um, and some of the theorems in that subject, um, that might make a little bit more sense as to why that's true. Otherwise, if you happen to have k being a composite number, which is the product of two or more distinct primes, sometimes you run into trouble, like not being able to find another um, unique or orthogonal Latin square. So if I write down, basically, if I write down a six by six Latin square, every other six by six Latin square can be achieved by row and column transforms on that original six by six one that I would write down. Um, so again, there's other little headaches that will come into if you're trying to design an experiment like this. Um, lastly, I will also say these can be extended further to hyper Greco Latin squares, which I'm not going to write down because it's going to be horrendously messy, where I'll say three or more orthogonal mutually orthogonal Latin squares are combined. Right. So yeah, in certain cases, it just doesn't work. Like when k is equal to six, math says, sorry, you can't do it. Um, but if k is equal to seven, then you can actually have, I think, well, mathematically, we could work it out. I think you can have six different um, orthogonal Latin squares. So you can just keep cramming them together, basically, to create some giant hyper Greco Latin square with lots of treatments all crammed into those, let's say, seven by seven or 49 observations. Of course, there's always the problem that, again, we don't, we have to assume that there are no interactions happening here or things will, um, well, fail in the sense that you might get some erroneous results because those interaction effects might bleed into the, the terms that you're testing and you may get or miss significance where you otherwise should or should not have seen it if that covers every single base in that sort of peculiar sentence. Right, so we're going to take a quick break. I'm going to go put something in the oven, and then I'm going to come back, and we're going to do an example of Latin square in R just to give you an idea of what's going on. And I'll tell you a little bit about how I use the Latin square myself in a recent research project when I was collecting data back, geez, I guess two summers ago now in 2019, um, when the heating was out or the air was out in our building and everything was horrendously oppressive. Um, but that's a story for another day. We will be right back and we'll talk about that then. All right, and we are back with the last part of our lecture. So what we have done so far is looked at two-way ANOVA and the Latin square and the Greco Latin square design. Um, what I'd like to do is show an example of the Latin square as it was used in agricultural research. And this data set is available in R. So you can download the package yourself and try it out yourself if you'd like to see this or more agricultural data sets. But first, actually, no, we'll do this first. <laughs> this is probably the first thing we should do. Uh, so what we're going to do is look at the Agridat library um, or package, I should say, in R which really just has hundreds of different experimental designs for agricultural data. The one we'll be looking at today is called Golden Latin, and this comes from a textbook on methods of statistical analysis. So the idea of this one is that we have a plot of land cut into 25 subplots, so it's a five by five Latin square, and every I guess the entire plot has wheat crops on it. I should move this up to the top so you can see. And the idea is that we want to test for how different treatments applied to each of the plots affects the growth of 
fungus or testing the uh, fungicidal properties of our different treatments. So here we have A through E. A is dusted before rains. B is dusted after rains. C is dusted once each week. And D is drifting once each week. I'm not actually sure what uh, drifting is, to be honest. I need to uh, read up on my uh, agricultural um, uh, lingo. And E is the not dusted. So E is just sort of the uh, control as if no treatment is applied. So here, uh, we actually do have a uh, Latin square. So if we look at the data, we have golden dot Latin, and it's going to look like this. So um, in R, so what we have here is we have our treatment factor, we have our yield, we have our row and our column. Now, the first thing we need to do is to make sure that R knows that the row and the column are in fact, um, are in fact categorical random variables. In this case, because they actually correspond to rows ordered one after the next, we can treat them as ordinal random variables. So I'm going to say as dot ordered, and we are going to say that, oh, not this, we need um, for the row, and we'll, no, I'm doing it backwards. Golden dot Latin dollar row is going to be ordered. Um, so this is just telling R that these numbers one through five are not literally the numbers one through five, but instead ordered factors um, with the levels one, two, three, four, five. Otherwise, the degrees of freedom will be all wrong in this case. And hmm, I wonder if there's an easy way. Eh, I'm not quite sure. If we were actually to, um, we could actually recreate this table um, yeah, actually, we can do that, right? We can just say, just to show you what the Latin square would look like, I can use a mat the matrix command and apply that to our treatment column and say five by five, and it should do column fills first. So this actually should work. Yeah. So this is what our Latin square is going to look like here. And if we stare at it, we should, hopefully, unless there's some major error, uh, only see one copy of A, B, C, D, and E in each row and in each column. And note that, again, the entire sample size is only 25, being 5 squared. Uh, so in this case, if we want to fit a model, we can use the AOV function, and we fit it really just as we would before, except that my, um, there it is, yield has fallen off the top of the screen. So what I can say is that the yield is going to be a function of the treatment, the row, and the column, and the data set we're going to consider is this golden Latin. And what do we do when we, or what do we get when we uh, look at our ANOVA table? Well, what we get is something, well, quite neat. What we see is, well, the treatment a very significant uh, F test. So that, that's good. That means that at least one of our treatments is performing differently than the others. We don't know which one yet. That's for the post hoc test. Um, but we also actually see a slightly significant result for the row and a very not significant result for the column. Again, um, we do have to consider the idea of multiple testing. So this first p-value for the treatment is extremely small, even if we were to do like a Bonferroni correction. The, um, the row one is still small enough that I think it's, it's worth investigating. Um, and then the column one is definitely not significant by any means. So, okay, let's uh, look a little bit more into that. Well, there's a couple things we can do. I guess the most sensible one would be to say, do Tukey HSD, apply it to MD. It's going to do a Tukey test for everything, so we're going to get a ton of output. Um, we want to ignore the column one, even though there are no significant p-values here. You have to be careful because sometimes you might see a significant p-value here, and it would be erroneous because the column factor is not significant at all. When we look at the row, we did see a small significance in the F test, and sure enough, when we look a little bit closer, we see a very significant p-value after, after adjusting for multiple testing. Um, 
between rows one and four. So that's quite interesting. And then this one is, again, not a little bit above that magical 5% threshold that Fisher said once, and now everybody treats as gospel. Um, but at least one in five, we say, okay, there's a there might be a significant difference between one and five. It's kind of close. Uh, the rest of them do not look very significantly different at all. So it's kind of hinting that, well, maybe something's happening as we go from row one all the way up to rows four and five as we move through the rows. Um, but um, yeah, that's something that I think we could look at a little bit later. Uh, more interestingly would be to look at the treatment because the treatment is really where we saw a very strong p-value um, and we can look to see where the significant differences lie. So A and C is very different and C is giving a better performance or a better yield than A, significantly stronger. Here C is giving a significantly stronger performance than B. Um, we see that D is giving a significantly weaker, see the negative sign here, a weaker performance than C. Um, and lastly, we see that um, E is also much weaker as a minus eight than C. So you always have to remember which one's being subtracted from which. E minus C is negative means that C is actually doing better yield-wise or getting a larger response than E. In this case, the response is the yield, which means that um, our fungicide must be working better because we're getting more wheat crop out um, at the end of the day. So from staring at this, the obvious thing is that, ah, yes, yeah, C seems to be the best. Um, and this is dusted once each week. So not considering, I guess, the rains or whatever drifting is, it just is kind of dust every week and yeah, you get a better wheat crop out, apparently. At least you get more yield, uh, and hopefully the fungicide washes off when you uh, process it, because you probably don't want to eat that, but I'm not actually sure what the uh, fungicide was that they were dusting with in this example, so eh, maybe it's safe enough. Regardless, that's how we can go about um, and study this. Um, and it is interesting, again, to note that um, here there actually was a significant row effect um, or a mildly significant row effect and a not very significant uh, column effect. And um, if you actually go back to the textbook, which I have quoted in my notes, the 1957 textbook by Golden, um, Methods of Statistical, or here it's 52, but there I had 57 for some reason, it must be a different edition, Methods of Statistical Analysis, um, he basically says that um, the uh, the shape of the plot is what matters. They were long and narrow. So I guess long, narrow plots. Hence, he says the columns are narrow strips running the length of the rectangular area. Under these conditions, the Latin square may have little advantage on the average over the randomized block plan. So again, it's a natural thing to try, but I guess in this case, because of the shape of the plot, right? Square doesn't necessarily mean square. I guess if we actually went back to his field in the 50s or whenever this experiment was done, each of those squares was not so much a square, but a long, thin rectangle. Um, but the Latin square design is still valid, even though the author here claims that you might just want to use some type of randomized block plan instead of the complete uh, or proper, say, Latin square design. So that's more or less it. There's really not much more to it. It is worth always looking at the degrees of freedom because here you can see it's K minus one, K minus one, K minus one, and K minus what? K minus three times K minus one, right? No, K minus two times K minus one, three times four. Yeah, three times four is 12. K minus two, K minus one. Yeah, it becomes K minus three if it was a Greco-Latin square, and then there'd be an extra treatment row um, somewhere in here as well. Right, so that's, uh, again, that's basically the whole thing. It's always good to look at the degrees of freedom because it lets you know that you're doing everything correctly. If, for example, I forgot to tell R that these are ordinal variables, um, then we would run into some trouble. 
and it would um, or categorical or ordinal variables it would give me one degree of freedom and not four and we'd know that we were doing something wrong um, so that's always a good thing to be aware of otherwise that's the whole example um, there's a lot of other places though where latin squares show up that aren't explicitly fields so what i wanted to take i guess five minutes just to say is that i actually used a latin square uh two years ago now in the summer of 2019 to collect some speech data. So yeah, basically I wanted to analyze some human speech. So I got my handy little audio recorder and went around and recorded people saying words. Um, I had 12 words in the study. We can look at the data output here in terms of what are called log periodograms. That's basically just like a intensity of the signal at different frequencies. So it's like a the intensity after you transform into from the from the uh, time, the temporal, to the frequency domain. The details are not important for this course. The, uh, the point is that if I have 12 words and I want my subjects to say them multiple times, what's the best way to, uh, to collect that data? Well, I could have a subject just say the first word 12 times, then the next word 12 times, then the next. But there could be subtle changes while, we're, um, while the subject is speaking into the microphone. There could be background noises because I'm just doing this like in my office. Someone could come down the hallway with a noisy cart, make some noise, corrupt the data. Um, you could also have the fact that as we move through the experiment or the data collection, I should say, the subject might get kind of tired and be like, you know what? This is super annoying after saying 100 plus words. Um, I'm getting kind of bored. I'm not really trying too hard, uh, maybe the pronunciation or the quality of the recording changes. So to account for all of that, um, what we did was we collected the data using a Latin square design. So each of the 12 words was read in some sense, each row contained each of the 12 words once, and there were 12 rows. Um, and every time the order was, I guess, something was randomized um, in the sense of a Latin square. So what that means is that if something changes as we move through the experiment, like there's background noise, like the speaker's a little bit more tired, we can account for that and we can then see that within the data. Um, luckily, in this case, the data was pretty clean, but we can still use the row and column means to kind of clean up the data a bit before trying to analyze the speech sounds themselves. <clears throat> Speaking of speech... Throat's getting a little dry. Um, but that's just an example of how you can use the Latin square design for data collection um, and have a more clever and experimentally robust way of getting your data, right? Because ultimately, we need to make sure that, um, well, we don't have any other confounding factors jumping in. So this gets back to the very first thing I think I said in the course, which is you got to randomize everything. So you take your Latin square, and in some sense, it kind of acts like a randomization. It will um, allow all the different factors or the different treatments to appear in different places throughout the design, um, whether that's spatially, like for an agricultural data, or whether it's temporally, like it was when I was having um, subjects read um, words or speak words into this uh, microphone. And uh, ultimately, yeah, that idea of randomization is really important. And I should say that um, you can find tables of Latin squares. So if you have an experiment that's like an 11 by 11 or 15 by 15, well, 15 is going to be weird because it's a composite number, but let's say 16 by 16 Latin square, you don't have to create it yourself. There's R packages that will generate the Latin square for you. Uh, there's also, I think in the textbook by Wu and Hamada, they actually have Latin squares in the back of the book. And what you can do is you can take your Latin square and you can randomize the column or the rows and randomize the columns. That is, you can do random column swaps and random row swaps, and you still have an equivalent Latin square. But by randomizing it, again, you're adding more randomization and you're making sure that you randomize your experiment as much as possible to control for other factors that may try to influence or confound what you're actually trying to test. So with that little rant about the Latin square, it's a pretty neat thing. I kind of like it. Um, I was happy to figure out a way to actually use it outside of, say, walking around in a field, which I don't really particularly want to do. Um, 
But yeah, I hope that that was interesting for all of you. And we're going to pick up again in the next lecture, and we're going to talk about even more types of uh, multi-factor experiments, including the balanced incomplete block design, what happens when you can't test every treatment within every block. We'll also talk about the split plot design, which gets into the idea of how do we randomize? What if we can't completely randomize all of our treatments? And how does that affect the outcome? Because sometimes you can't randomize everything like you would like to, and you have to analyze that data very carefully in that case. But we'll talk about that in the next lecture. So look forward to seeing you there.